Okay, so I mentioned that I wanted to be an astronaut. So I've shown this picture here because I think it's really, um, well, it's just really cool and gives you a sense of scale of how big the International Space Station uh, is. So at the moment, um, when we, if you train as an astronaut, the place you're going to go is to the International Space Station. And to give you a sense of scale, I don't know if you can see, but here is an astronaut. So the the International Space Station is absolutely massive, bigger than you know a football pitch basically, and all this stuff has been taken up into space by um, by our kind of various shuttles and things, and put together in space during spacewalks, um, or kind of attached. Um, remote by remote control so it's a really really awesome thing and the um at least in europe the european space agency is currently um asking for people to apply to become an astronaut so if you uh, are interested in becoming an astronaut um do apply anyway so uh we start here on our earth we are the third rock from uh the sun this is a is an artist's impression it is not to scale the planets are not uh, this close together, and Jupiter is kind of hundreds of times bigger than the Earth. So, um, but this is kind of just to show you our place in the solar system here on the Earth. And uh, to be a solar system, you are, we generally consider our solar system is kind of a group of bodies, uh, planets that are orbiting around a kind of central um, star. So the sun is our star. This is what the sun looks like from a satellite in space. And um, obviously you couldn't really, um, well, see the sun looking like this because if you looked at it for too long, you'd go blind. So I don't recommend that at all. Do not look directly at the sun. Um, but when you have a telescope with specific filters on it, you can see um, very well and in very high detail what is going on inside our sun. So you can see these things here called prominences. The sun has a very strong magnetic field and these kind of these kind of little bits here you can see is where material is kind of being thrown off by the sun. And in this picture the sun looks very kind of orange and if you go out in the day like it's a very sunny day today um, the sun looks very yellow. So so Stars like the sun, which are halfway through their life, um, tend to be orange or yellow in colour. But the star, our sun, the star, isn't the only uh, star in our galaxy. We have about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. And this is what a kind of typical spiral galaxy like our Milky Way uh, looks like if you're looking kind of down on it. We don't see our Milky Way looking like this because we're inside it. Um, so we see our Milky Way galaxy looking more like this. So even in this picture of our Milky Way as seen from the ground, you can see there is lots of gas and dust and there is also uh, different colours of stars. So you have the yellowy, orangey stars just like our sun, but you can also see some blue stars and some red stars in here. And the reason why the Milky Way looks like a kind of stripe across the sky is because we are inside that spiral arm of the galaxy. So all of these stars you can see in this image are in the Milky Way. But as you look out through the galaxy from our position on the Earth, the third rock from the Sun, the spiral arm of the galaxy is like basically like sweeping around in front of us. So we see most of the stars in this kind of uh, area. And if you go to places away from the city lights, um, like here in Wales, if you go into the Brecon Beacons, where it's really dark and you're away from any kind of city uh, light pollution, you can see the Milky Way. Not as bright as this, but you can see a kind of definite stripe across the sky. And the Greeks actually called it the Milky Way because they thought it looked like somebody had spilt milk across the sky. So this is Orion. And this is a winter constellation, so you should still be able to see it now on, on, a, on a clear night. Um, from here in the northern hemisphere, uh, we see, well, you can always see these three stars here in a line, Orion's belt. And from the northern hemisphere, if you go up to the left-hand corner, you see uh, a kind of reddy, 
orange stuff. This is called beetle juice and this is the armpit of Orion basically. So Orion is a hunter, you have to use your imagination but like imagine his head is here, these are his shoulders and these are his legs and the belt is around his middle. So in the in the sword of Orion there is something called the Orion Nebula and this is where stars are being born. Um, so stars live and die, it's just that they take billions of years to live and die. So this kind of nebula here, if we zoomed in on it, we would see lots of gas that is kind of clumping together. And when there is enough, um, when gravity has allowed enough of the stuff to, to stick together, um, it will form stars. You need high, very high temperatures as well for this to happen. You basically need something called fusion to start happening and then the star is essentially born. So at the very beginning of a star's life, they're incredibly hot and they will be kind of white or blue. Uh, it's the opposite to what you might think based on your kitchen taps. The blue and white stars are kind of hundreds of thousands of degrees, um, whereas older stars like Betelgeuse is coming towards the end of its life are only perhaps 3,000 degrees. And our sun is about 6,000 degrees. So the sun is, is in the kind of middle stage of its life, uh, what we call the main sequence and stars like Betelgeuse are something called a red supergiant star. They've got a lot older, their um, kind of outer shell of the star is kind of like expanded up um, and the star has cooled down so it's a lot more red. And this can actually be seen with your eyes. You don't need any fancy telescopes. You could go out tonight if it's clear, find Orion's belt and then look at uh, look up to the left at least in the northern hemisphere and see uh, this very bright red star um, with your eyes very easily. This star down here I should mention as well is a very kind of whitey blue star it's very young and this one is called Rigel and this is in the foot of Orion. So this is actually kind of uh, well it is kind of trying to show you to scale the different sizes between the stars. So we've learned about the different colors that are related to the temperature and age of the star, but the, um, the size is also kind of related to how far along the star is in its life cycle, but also can just be related to how much matter there was when that star started to form. So you can see that Betelgeuse, the, the first star I mentioned in Orion, because it is a red supergiant, is much, much, much bigger um, than the sun and and Rigel again which is a, which is a new 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 star very young star very hot star uh, in the foot of Orion is is still much bigger than the sun but nowhere near as big as Betelgeuse so this is the what we call the life cycle of the star diagram this diagram is showing you the kind of two different branches that a star can go down so because the sun is a kind of average star uh, it would have formed from, from a stellar nebula. It is halfway through its life, 5 billion years, uh, another 5 billion years or so uh, to go. But when it does uh, start to die, this essentially means the sun is going to start to run out of hydrogen that it can then um, kind of form into helium. And that's how it releases energy. So if it runs out of hydrogen, it can't uh, kind of fuel itself any longer and it becomes a red giant. Uh, for the sun, that means that it will swell up to, um, well, it will be bigger. It, the sun's orbit, the, sorry, the, the edge of the sun will actually go beyond the orbit of Mars. So um, that isn't very good news for the Earth. But the, this isn't for like four billion years or so. I think it will be about a billion years before the, the kind of, the extra heat coming from the sun due to its expansion um, will start to burn off our atmosphere. But again, a billion years is a one with nine zeros, so it's no need to worry about that uh, at the moment. So when the star, like the sun, comes to, uh, well, starts to get into this red giant phase, just before it comes to the end of its life, uh, there will be an imbalance between the pressure forces in the star and the gravitational forces outside the star. Um, and the star will just kind of start to throw off its outer layers 
in a quite an undramatic way and we call that a planetary nebula. So the core that's left over that was at one point the centre and the core of the star, like the Sun, will just become a kind of very boring white dwarf star. Uh, the other way, the other type of stars, when there is much more uh, matter that kind of sticks together from the stellar nebula, these massive stars uh, live maybe a more exciting life, as it were. They become a red supergiant star, so they become much, much bigger, um, like you saw with Betelgeuse. And then when they finally die, they uh, do so in a very, very bright supernova explosion. And these supernova explosions are um, much brighter than the kind of all the stars in the galaxy combined. Um, but they, they, the explosion um, maybe only lasts um, a few days or weeks. So it's really important for our astronomers now who want to observe supernova explosions happening that they're, um, well, they're not only looking at a very big area of the, of the sky, um, but they're also trying to actually um, catch the time when the star actually explodes and has um, the most brightness. Okay, so the brighter the star is, I guess the brighter it is, uh, the easier it is, is to see. And then it's very interesting for us to see how the brightness of that star over time gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So the supernova explosion happens and then the core of the star that is incredibly dense is left over, either becomes a neutron star or a black hole. So if the, um, the core that's left is about three times the size of the sun or less than three times the mass of the sun, then the core will become something called a neutron star. Um, and if it is more than three times bigger than the, the mass of the sun, then the thing that's left over will become a black hole. But today we're mainly focusing on this stage here, the supernova stage. So you can get a supernova um, happening due to a star coming to the end of its life. But what you can also get is a supernova that happens when you have something like a white dwarf that just happens to be near another, um, another star. But because the white dwarf is really, really dense, it will still have a lot of gravity. So the white dwarf will kind of, just, just because of gravity, material will start to fall from the nearby star onto the white dwarf. But a white dwarf star can only have, uh, can only exist as a white dwarf star um, up to a certain mass limit. And this mass limit is 1.4 times the mass of the sun. So the white dwarf star can happily survive as long as it doesn't go over this mass limit. But if lots more mass is kind of coming onto the white dwarf, um, there will be an instability um, kind of at the surface of this white dwarf, and then it will also cause a supernova explosion. Um, and these type of supernova explosions are really uh, useful because they always happen at this specific mass limit. So the explosion is always as a result of pretty much um, the same amount of material. So if you have the same material, the same amount of it exploding, you can make some uh, assumptions about how bright that explosion will be. Uh, again, so this is a artist's impression of uh, a supernova. This isn't what they would really look like. But this uh, image kind of shows you the fact that when the star does actually explode, um, there, there's not only um, it, 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 explosion happens in in a few seconds, and it means because it's happening so fast, the inner material of the star is is heating to kind of hundreds of thousands of degrees. So because those temperatures are so high, it means it can not only fuse things like hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen. Um, it can now fuse even more complex elements because it has enough energy to do so. So all the more complicate, complex elements like kind of gold and silver uh, are created in, in the actual death of a star. And everything that you are made of, like carbon um, and the oxygen you breathe, it is, is chucked out into the universe when these massive stars explode because inside they have layers and layers of different elements that they've been fusing as part of this 
process to keep the star alive. Okay, so in this next star, next star, in this next slide, you can see uh, I've got some pictures of candles and some pictures of galaxies. Now, this is just to show you if there is a supernova explosion going off in a galaxy, we can measure the brightness of that star. So here you are, there is a very bright star that's gone off in the galaxy. Uh, but this star, uh, sorry, so, so, so we can measure the brightness of this, uh, we can measure the brightness of this uh, supernova in this galaxy, and that's fine. But then if the, if the, so the type of supernova that I was talking about earlier, where they are a result of a white dwarf having too much matter um, kind of pouring onto it, and then it explodes in a supernova. This type of supernova is called a type 1a supernova. And like I said, because it is um, as a result of the same amount of matter, you can assume that a supernova type 1a is, is a specific brightness. So the example you can think of here is with a candle. So if you have a candle and you see its flame, you can assume that the brightness of that flame from, from this candle is always going to be the same. So therefore, if you make that assumption, the brightness you measure here when the candle is close to you is going to be much higher than the brightness you measure here when the candle is very, very far away from you. So the only difference in the two values you measure for the same candle and the same flame is due to the brightness. So you could quite easily, um, based on the assumption that the knowing how much the, the brightness falls off with distance, you could, you could then um, measure how far away this candle is based on how bright you measure it to how bright you know it to be. So we can apply the same idea to the supernova type 1a we see in a galaxy. So if a supernova type 1a goes off in this galaxy um, and we measure it to be really, really bright, then we know that galaxy is much closer to us than the supernova type 1a we measure here, which isn't very bright. So it's a lot, it's a lot less brighter than this one. Uh, which we know to be incredibly close, so we can say, well, not only that this galaxy is 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 further away, but we can actually measure the distance. So the supernova uh, type 1a, as I said, are a standard candle or a way of measuring the distances to, to those uh, supernova. And when we know the distances to lots of different galaxies uh, very accurately, then we can kind of start to build up a picture of how the universe looks in a kind of 3D way. Um, and then we don't only know the distances from looking at the, um, the color of the light in those galaxies, how red or blue it is, we can actually determine how fast those, uh, those galaxies are moving away from us. So we can get a measure of the speed of the galaxy and the distance of the galaxy. From, from the supernova itself. Um, and basically the resulting, uh, so the result of, so then when we have a picture of, uh, so, so what we do is we use uh, surveys such as the dark energy survey to kind of survey an area of the sky and uh, see where those where those galaxies are, measure their distance and their um, measure their distance and their speed. And what we uh, what we've realised is the universe is accelerating. Okay, so this actually means that galaxies. Um, are not only moving away at a, a kind of a constant speed then, the galaxies that are further away from us are actually accelerating in their expansion. And if you ever want to accelerate something, you need to give it energy. Um, so we know there is some kind of energy which is making galaxies accelerate away, get faster. 
So we know that there is something causing galaxies to move away uh, or speed up, if you like, in, in their movement. And this energy, we just call it dark energy. We do not know where it is, but the, the universe is expanding in this accelerating fashion and there is no way in physics you can just get energy created from nothing. It violates all of the physics we know. So we know dark energy is something that is out there and the way... The way we can try to kind of understand one of the mysteries of dark energy is to have these accurate maps, accurate distances, accurate velocity values for the galaxies. Um, and then we get a much more better uh, understanding of the, um, the actual value of this acceleration, which is called the Hubble's constant. Uh, because I'm specifically focusing on, on our dark energy survey research in, in Southampton, I thought I'd just show you uh, the telescope that is used to take the, um, the survey, uh, the camera inside the dark energy survey uh, telescope um, looks like this. And then when you, when you have the picture of the field that the, the, the camera is looking at, you can see that within this field there are lots of, of galaxies. Um, so when I was, I was out in Chile, this is a picture of me out in Chile in front of the telescope. When I was there with Charlotte, we were, um, there for a whole week taking pictures of, um, of supernova that were going off and then trying to classify them. So we were, um, specifically interested in those ones, which were the type 1A, which would allow, um, which would allow her to be able to uh, get a better handle on kind of dark energy itself. These are some of the careers. So I am uh, an astrophysicist who's gone into science communication. A lot of my colleagues who I work with have stayed on in academia and are kind of professional uh, astrophysicists, academics, lecturers, um, postdocs, that kind of thing. Uh, but there are lots of my friends who've also gone into kind of what we call kind of software engineering, uh, making apps uh, to be able to analyze these large data sets like from the dark energy survey you need to be very good at coding so they've learned languages uh, like python for example um, and these languages they learn to do their scientific research are very useful uh, in um, companies and digital industries uh, which are very popular at the moment for example, also like things like data science, where companies that have a lot of data, uh, be it on like how we shop. Or, so lots of companies need data scientists, uh, charities who have kind of large data sets about um, needs um, people who can code and who can think logically and doing kind of a physics degree um, actually gives you really good skills that those kind of companies would uh, really really need so yeah a lot of my friends have gone into that and um, there's also um, kind of the models you use to um, to simulate things in space can also be applied to kind of finance uh, and banking and specifically some of the people who work with me doing outreach uh, in the community and in schools have gone into things like uh, people relations and marketing working with formula one teams all sorts of exciting stuff so um, there are lots of careers from doing kind of physics or astrophysics that you might not have thought of. Uh, if you are interested in learning more, uh, we have a stargazing module, a free online module, which you can go on to. Uh, there's also something called the Aurora Zoo, where you can engage with our Aurora Zoo research. Um, the Sutton Astro Art Project, if you want to know more about that, and the artists we've worked with, the public events we've done, uh, then if you just go onto the Sutton Astro Art WordPress website, um, and the Dark Energy Survey has a website as well, darkenergysurvey.org. Uh, and that's it from me. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to tweet me uh, at Sutton Astrodome, and I will do my best to answer your questions. Uh, thank you for watching.